Hello everyone, welcome to Spatial Exploits, a new channel discussing the beautiful game's players, teams, and managers from a tactical perspective. At Euro 2020 this summer, Frank de Boer's Netherlands team collected all 9 points to top Group C, joining only Italy and Belgium in that achievement. La Orania's dominance came to a screeching halt the very next match however, as the sensational Patrick Schick and the Czech Republic knocked out the Dutch in the round of 16. That match saw Matthias de Ligt red carded in the 55th minute for an obvious handball, and with only 10 men, the Netherlands caved under the heavy bevy of chances created by the Czechs and caught an early flight home from Budapest as total football transformed into total calamity. In the immediate aftermath of this sudden knockout, the Dutch FA announced on the 29th of June that manager Frank de Boer had departed. De Boer has announced that he does not want to continue, which is also in line with the contract between both De Boer and the Dutch FA, which required a place in the quarterfinals. That contract will not be renewed. As the Dutch begin to search for their next manager, it's important to remember that amidst the shock defeat to the Czech Republic, there were still some fascinating displays of football from the Netherlands at Euro 2020. The sensational right wing back Denzel Dumfries from PSV Eindhoven showcased his attacking prowess through his constant lung bursting runs on the right flank. Frankie de Jong highlighted the importance of his carrying, dribbling and passing abilities at the heart of the Dutch midfield. And Liverpool star and PSG's latest signing Gini Wijnaldum embraced the captaincy as he led by example with his 110% effort at all times mentality as he bagged a handful of important goals during the group stages. For those stars to feel full freedom in their games and produce with fearless intent, they had to know they would be supported by a solid defensive structure behind them. And this is where Atalanta's Martin Daron comes into the picture. At age 30, Daron brings with him nearly a half decade of experience working under the careful watch of Gian Piero Gasparini, who is endlessly fascinated by the concept of total football, which Daron's home nation invented. His defensive enforcer role at the heart of the Dutch midfield is what served as the nexus point for the Dutch offense to burst forward in every match at Euro 2020. And ultimately, without his defensive acumen and tactical understanding of the game, it is possible that De Boer's men would have struggled to lift off, even in the group stages. Let's make the switch to the pitch diagram and properly assess the importance of Martin de Rohn to the Dutch national team. So on the pitch diagram here, we have the 3-5-2 formation that Frank de Boer had fielded throughout the Euro 2020 campaign. And against the opening match against Ukraine, this was the starting 11 that he went with. So he had a new defensive partner named Jurian Timber into the fold so that Matthias De Ligt could miss the opening match due to injury recovery. And in the next match, what happened was Timber was taken out and then De Vrij actually came into his positioning and De Ligt went into here in the central defensive role, basically like a sweeper. And then Daily Blind stayed in, but at times Blind would be taken out later in the match as he got tired so that Nathan Ake of Manchester City could come in. He's a left footed center back as well. So that was an easy transition going from Blind to Ake. For the left wing back positioning, Patrick Van Anholt was sometimes taken out in order for Weindahl to come in into this positioning as well. Dumfries basically stayed constant the whole time and he was excellent as mentioned earlier in the video. Martin Daron was starting every match as well, but at times, I think the third match against North Macedonia, he was taken out of the starting lineup for rest purposes and the young starlet from Ajax, Robin Gravenberg, was able to slot into his positioning. Frankie de Jong started every match and basically was usually never substituted. Jorginho Wijnaldum, same principle, Memphis as well. Wout Weghorst up front was sometimes taken out for Luke de Jong, and if Luke de Jong was not placed in, then Daniel Mollen, who's a prodigy at PSV, was also able to slot in. So this is the Dutch lineup as it was contending at the Euros. In goal, Martin Stecklenburg was able to reprise his role as the top choice keeper. He was the keeper when the Dutch made it to the 2010 World Cup final against Spain and South Africa. And then he took a little bit of a break from international football and now he's back in the fold. And as his backups, he had Tim Krul and Bizo as well. The thing to remember about Martin Stecklenburg is that usually in a better time, Jasper Sillison would have been the first choice keeper, but Sillison had an injury right before the tournament started. So 
the Dutch had to go in with Stucklingberg, who was a tried and tested veteran. But the problem with Stucklingberg is he's not the most adept passer, so for the Dutch to build out from the back, which is usually what they're trying to do every tournament, it is a little bit of a difficult proposition. So what the Dutch were trying to do was hold on to the possession of the ball for as much as possible so that there'd be less chances against Stucklingberg. And over time, Stucklingberg has been a very good stot stopper, so if it came down to it, he could stop a couple of shots, but he wouldn't be the goalie that would be able to allow the Dutch to sit deep and build out from the back. So let's talk a little bit about how the Dutch play out from the back, and we'll put a lot of the players back in. So we'll replace Malin again, put him on the bench, put Weghorst in, and take out Weindahl, put in Patrick Van Anholt back in again. So the Dutch, when they are starting play from the back, so if there's a goal kick in contention, what ends up happening is De Ligt goes here, De Vrij forms the width, Ake would go here as well, and Daly Blind was usually the starter here, so Let's place him here, and De Jong would be somewhere here, and Daron would come in here. So what it would do is create a diamond here between Daron, De Vry, De Ligt, and Blind. And once you have the diamond here, that sets up the defensive structure so that De Jong can join more so with Gini Wijnaldum at front. And as the Dutch are building out from the back, one of the things that happens is as they all progress forwards, there were times where basically every other player was here in this top line trying to break the structure of the defense and in the group stages at least the Netherlands faced teams that are historically very low block teams so Ukraine sits in a low block as does North Macedonia so those are all teams that sit on a low block they sit deep within their own half and so the Netherlands have to commit tons and tons of players in order to have any chance on goals created. But essentially when they're building out from the back they do space out like this to provide the width the ball usually goes from stecklenburg to either De Ligt if he's open but if not then he goes to blind blind from his left foot can find de Jong or wan or he can send a creative deep ball to memphis to pie or find the head of about weghorst as well but if all of those are not in play sometimes they'll recycle the ball back to De Ligt, who goes to Daron, who can also go to De Rai on here and then De Rai has some capability to dribble with the ball so he can start going up the pitch with it in tandem and then once he's here he can either shift the ball off to Genie Wijnaldum or Wijnaldum can go right to Dumfries who can then sprint forward with the ball and have some crossing in here. Same thing goes for Patrick Van Onholt who can go a little bit up the corridor here on the left flank and then send a few crosses in for the head of Bout Weckhorst or Memphis Defy to latch on to. So now on the pitch diagram we have a few opposition players in the blue markers here as well as their goalie in yellow and this is to indicate yet again through an opposition press how the Netherlands can beat the uh, press in order to keep progressing the ball up the pitch. So as mentioned before if the guys here are pushing up into the defensive partners then one of the things they can do is really drop right in direct line with Stecklingberg and De Ligt even can go here and Daron can then give a passing option here and what this really symbolizes is this means if the defense keeps pressing them in this manner to really just cast out any of these oppositional players then the Netherlands can do what they're actually really good at which is trying to just field a long ball up to their forwards. So if the opposition looks similar to this then that's almost perfect for the Netherlands too because they can definitely contend with something like this where Stecklingberg then produces a long wall out to Weghorst. He can then turn it into Wijnaldum who could be breaking loose and then Memphis Depay can make a run here this way and it'd be an open chance on goal here for Memphis. So if the team for the opposition presses really high up during goal kicks like this or as the Dutch are building out from the back, they have enough capacity in their passing from even the back. So Daly Blind is one of those examples where during his time at Manchester United, he was notorious for having this ability to ping the ball really far up the pitch. And then if it found a notable forward up top, then they could have a one-two here with the midfield and eventually find their way to goal by just having a well-timed run. So the ability to play out from the back where there's heavy pressure like this is totally fine for the Dutch and it's a trademark for most Dutch teams. Against most oppositions, the Dutch will find a way to have a series of cascading short passes as they move further up the pitch, really pinning the opposition back into their own half. And once they're pinned back into their own half, 
Dutch through total football principles also believe in keeping the ball moving swiftly between players within the midfield and defense and forwards and as they're doing that they're also mindful of the fact that they need to operate in either the left or the right half space in order to maximally utilize the available space and to create overloads so the natural width of a Dutch formation allows them to have at least one player to edging the touchline so usually it will be the left wing back and on the right hand side it will be the right wing back Dumfries and depending on the situation in this model the play has shifted over to the right hand flank so it will be basically pinballing around with Weikhorst, Dumfries, Daron, Wijnaldum, sometimes De Jong could even come in here and Daron could shift back, De Vrij could go in and then there's more passing triangles here even if the defense starts pressing upwards the pitch then it's much much easier because the ball can then go to De Jong or Wijnaldum then both of them can tiki taka their way either through short passes interchange between them or they can take whatever they're getting from the defense and just basically dribble with the ball through the defense and find different passing options within the penalty area. In his role as a holding midfielder, one of the things that Martin Daron provides to the Dutch national team is his ability to cover for both Wijnaldum and Frankie de Jong. So hypothetically, within the five-person midfield here, de Jong and Daron should be the furthest back. But because Daron is so good in the defensive capabilities of the game, he is able to make sure that if the ball is turned over within these, these vulnerable areas where a quick counterattack can be launched through the opposing players, Martin Daron is able to, if he spots some of those things, he's able to assess the situation unfolding here if this is a turnover where Wijnaldum turns the ball over to this opposing player. He'll assess the situation, he'll realize very quickly that the options are very limited. Most players under that much pressure can't just find a ball here or find a long pass here. There's just not enough time and space to carry a move out like that. So what Daron does is he'll heavily press and within the Dutch footballing mechanism, the player who turned the ball over also has to aggressively press and any player in and around the area starts to control converge into the ball carrier from the offensive side. And once this player in blue here decides to turn the ball over, Daron or Wijnaldum or Dumfries, any of these players are able to catch him red-handed and then swiftly move to more open areas of the pitch where De Jong can then start to do his magic, dribble around a bit and pass the ball to Wijnaldholt out to the left flank. So the key advantages of operating in the half space is that the defense is so, so compressed that a player of Martin Daron's capabilities is able to collect some of those stray passes and some of those aggressive maneuvers within the up position half once they recover the ball and because of his ability to then recycle the ball to more adept players and passers within the team they're able to then immediately switch the play over to the left hand flank and then get an overload going on that direction before the offense has been able to switch back over. One of the things that makes Martin Daron a standout player is he's able to seamlessly transition and fall back allowing the other two midfielders to fo fall forward and this switch up here between him and Dervai is very important because Dervai is a little bit more capable going forward from the center half position so with Daron falling back to provide defensive coverage it can really open up spaces for Dervai to connect up with Weghorst or Dumfries here and if he gets caught deep into the opposition half the team is not left without a capable center back so Dervai I believe is six foot two inches and Daron is six foot one and you're not losing a whole lot in terms of defensive coverage because Daron at times for Atalanta also plays as a center back but usually he's a right-sided holding midfielder for both club and country. Additionally when things are operating a little bit more normally what occurs is you'll find Daron switching between this area here as well as this area here so he stays sequestered to the right hand side of the pitch and even if play has transitioned over to this side he'll he'll jog his way over to this section of the pitch to provide a little bit more coverage if the ball does need to come back out to delict there's already a ready-made option for a cutting record if Daron can find him but one of the strains from Martin Daron is his ability to read the game so usually as the play here breaks down or if there's a turnover he's one of the first ones to start hustling back in because he realizes that a counterattack of this nature could come in and Holland don't have the fastest of center backs so for all of them to come back in would be a tough proposition especially if the wing backs in Van Aanholt and Dumfries are serving as as support wingers while the team is building up play so Netherlands is the most 
vulnerable when they are turning the ball over deep into the opposition half because if the opposition is well aware of how to fan out in counterattacks, then they can really cause damage to the team. When the opposition has the ball and they're building up from the back as well, and as they approach the dangerous midfield areas, Daron also looks to ensure that Holland wins the midfield battle every time. So one of the things he does is from his deep lying role, he's able to see much of the game and read the game properly. So what he can do is direct Wijnaldum if this opposition player has the ball and he's dribbling his way into here, he can see multiple options. So one is to go to this player or a direct pass over to this player. And so one of the things Daron usually, you can see him in the frame, when he's directing traffic where he says to Wijnaldum, hey, press this guy. And then he tells also to De Vrij simultaneously to press this person. So then that cuts off any passes over the top to here because De Ligt would normally catch that. Ake would catch this pass. De Jong usually, along with Van Aanholt, would be able to cover this area. And he, going back is potentially an option. He can go all the way back to the goalie or build up to this player here who can then start play again from the back. But usually... If Daron directs traffic right, you can still have an opposition player streaking in like this if Dumfries doesn't get back on time. And there's a good chance that as hardworking as Dumfries is, he sometimes he's caught too far up the field, so he's usually not back. Like sometimes he's over here and lagging behind the last opposition player at times. So in those cases, Daron, as this runner is streaking in and creating an open passing lane, Daron would try to make sure that he is covered very tightly, so even if the pass does take place with Daron's ball winning capabilities and his aggression off the ball, he can ensure that he can win whatever challenge or at least contain the challenge until more of, the, until more of his teammates can come in and help him out defensively. So whenever he is contending with a one-on-one -on -one challenge or one-on-one -on -one threat, he's able to make sure that he can head the ball away. So there will be multiple times during a match where you can see Daron head the ball towards a player on his team just to ensure that the ball gets retained possession-wise. If the opposition team is turning the ball over, then at the same time he'll put a good head on the ball to make sure it ends up being a forward pass or he can end up recycling back to his own team members and they can then start to build up play again. One of the other things is if he doesn't have a shot to do a header to recycle the ball back, one of the ways he'll try to win the ball is simultaneously in one move, he'll just boot the ball high up the pitch and then that allows Memphis or any other cutting streaker like Weikhorst, sometimes if Weikhorst is out and Daniel Mullen is in the game, and in this case is he can just punt the ball. Instead of heading it, he opts to then just kick it really, really far up and, and in such an event, if most of the opposition team that the Dutch are playing against are pressed high up and they're playing a high line, his Daron's kicking the ball really far out back into the opposition half can catch the opponent sleeping because then fast forwards like Memphis or Daniel Molland or even Dumfries here are able to attack with plenty of space and these recovering defenders don't really have the offside advantage because most of the Dutch players were already sequestered into their own half. So Sometimes Daron, if he notices that his own team is pressed up like this, he'll try to create from the back by just booting the ball up and seeing what can happen if his own teammate's pace contends with other opposition players. Having said that, one of Daron's deficiencies over time has been his lack of pace and his ability to not completely secure the ball in areas where it does need to be secured. So at times, Daron You'll see him dribbling here and there, but most of the time he is looking to play a easy, safe pass to other members of the team who are more creatively inclined. And to be quite honest, if you have Memphis, Dumfries, Wijnaldum, De Jong on the team, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for Martin Daron, who's more of a defensive enforcer type of player, to be launching counterattacks. Most of the time, Daron's job is to win the tackle and win it completely. And once he can recycle the ball back to other players that are more forward oriented, they can then launch counterattacks themselves. Additionally, his passing from the short distances is pretty good because that's his usual forte is to recycle the ball, play it safe, have a high passing accuracy number at the end of the match. But for long passes, at times when the opposition is pinned back, so if we drag everybody back here, then there are times where from the right hand flank Daron will launch crosses to see if anybody on his team can latch onto them and then maybe have a shot on goal. So all in all, to recap, 
Martin de Rhone does play a vital role for the Dutch national team and his role is basically to cover and provide insurance for Denzel Dumfries to have attacking intent and mobility at the top of the spear of their attack as well as ensuring that he's covering for de Vrij when he's pushing up as well so this space here becomes very much a defensive target zone for de Rhone when his team is playing defense or when the rest of the team is pressed up higher up on the pitch and when he's not conducting defensive duties he's more of the conductor of the team alongside de Jong so in a double pivot which is usually what the Dutch play on de Rhone would be here and de Jong would be here and they'd be playing off of one another and providing the central defensive coverage but because de Rhone is able to so remarkably handle his defensive duties it liberates de Jong to forego some of those responsibilities and press higher and higher up allowing the Dutch to commit more and more bodies up front and allowing them to create more and more chances on goal. Drone's not by any means a perfect player either because he is as mentioned lacking in some very very notable qualities that other replacements on the Dutch team have for strengths. So for example if you take Drone out and you put in the Ajax starlet Gravenberg one of the things he's really good with is progressive dribbling as well as carrying the ball forwards and back. This is, these are not some of the fortes of Daron. And Gravenberg, on the other hand, is not as defensively minded as Daron is. So there are some pluses and minuses and depending on how the team wants to play heading into the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, it is interesting to see if Daron is able to retain his spot because it will be yet another season that Gravenberg has with Ajax under his belt and for a 19 year old like him it would be an interesting journey to see how much he grows within the next 12 to 13 months before the world cup begins i don't think it'll be enough for jerome to be unseated from his double pivot role next to de Jong, but only time will tell if however jerome is on the national team he stays injury free for the next year and a half then in qatar it is quite possible that the dutch put this heavy loss of euro 2020 behind them and go back to the drawing board, have a new manager to work with. It seems like Louis van Gaal may be coming into the fold once again. So with those types of maneuverings, it may change the setup of the team, may change the tactics of the team. The Dutch may go back to a 4-3-3. In those cases, does De Rhone become the holding midfielder with De Jong and Wijnaldum? So similar to the role he's playing now, would he be able to retain that? And if not, then what happens to the three-man defensive partnership here as well? So one of them would have to go. So potentially Ake would go so that Van Anholt or Daly Blind could be at left back and then Dumfries could become a right back. So a 4-3-3 is definitely possible with this setup and one other player could come in. So either Promise, Gakpo, or Wout Weckhorst could also come in here as well to round off the front three. So La Aranya have everything cut out for them for the next 14 months until the World Cup. And when that arrives in Qatar, the basic structure of the team shouldn't be changing. And they will be relying on Martin Daron more than ever to put together one great performance after another if they want to make it to the final of the World Cup once again, as they did in 2010.